Okay. Um, <clears throat> in the uh, last lecture, we talked about uh, R and N. And uh, today's lecture would be mainly about attention mechanism. Uh, you know, we have a model which is called transformer introduced in 2017, and it replaced almost all usage of R and N. Uh, almost. And uh, it's based on a concept which is called uh, attention or self-attention. So our lecture today is mainly about this concept and uh, what does it mean and how it can be calculated. And basically transformer uh, originally introduced in a paper uh, with the interesting name attention is all you need. Basically you don't need the, I mean, the attention itself introduced in the context of RNN originally. But then they realized that apparently attention is all you need and you don't need this structure anymore. And you can take care of sequential data with just the concept of attention. <clears throat> but before we uh, learn about attention, <clears throat> let me um, start with the concept of encoder, decoder which can be also used in uh, RNNs to make sequence-to-sequence -sequence models. You know, uh, imagine that you have a, a word like elephant in English. This word can be translated to French, it can be translated to Spanish, it can be translated to Persian, it can be you can represent an elephant with an image of elephant. You know, there are many different ways to represent same concept. You can think of this concept as an, some sort of abstraction. You have abstraction of the elephant in your mind. And if you speak English, when you want to talk about this abstraction, you use the word elephant. And if you speak Persian, when you want to talk about the concept of elephant, you would say feel. Or you may not actually verbally talk, I mean, uh, convey the abstraction in, and, and, you know, just show a picture or draw a picture, right? Uh, so the concept that we have in mind can be formed in, in, in different ways, right? So this is the, the, the core idea of encoder decoders. The idea is that the, if you want to translate the word elephant to its Spanish form, I don't pronounce it because I'm not sure if I pronounce the Spanish correctly. Then I know feel is correct, you know. Okay, so if you want to translate this word, this English word, to another language, then uh, you may have an encoder which takes this word and represent it as a vector such that this vector can be decoded to Spanish, to Persian, to an image, to any different form. And you can think of this uh, vector as the abstraction that you have in mind, as if you have something in your mind and you can give it a different form. So think of encoder, which uh, basically takes one of the forms of this abstraction and turn it to the abstraction. And think of decoder as taking this abstraction and give it different forms, new forms, okay? So this is quite important. And in, in, in a way, the whole machine learning or the whole deep learning is about representation learning, you know, how we represent a concept in, in, in different form. Uh, we learned about RNN in the previous lecture. And you know how, how RNN works. It has some hidden uh, vectors and, you know, you have inputs. And each uh, hidden vector is influenced by the previous hidden vector through some weights and the current observation. Okay. R and N can be think of as 
a structure which take a sequence and represent it as a vector. You know, you can basically, if you have a sentence here, and the first word of the sentence and uh, make this hidden state, and the second word of the sentence influenced by the previous state, make this hidden state up to the end. When you get to the end of the sentence, you have a vector representation. The last hidden space is a vector representation. This is that concept, okay? So R and N can be seen as sequence to vector. Now, think of sequence to sequence as if you're connecting two RNNs to each other. And the first RNN is your encoder when it, gives, it, it takes, say, a sequence like a sentence and make this abstraction. And we call this abstraction from now on context vector. It makes a context vector. So this is a representation of the whole sentence in, in one single vector. And then you have another RNN which takes this vector and try to give it a different form. The first one is French and you want to translate it to English, for example. Okay. So um, the assumption is that the whole French sentence has been distilled in this vector. This is an abstraction. This is your thought about your, your in, in your mind about the sentence and you can give it different form. You can say it what you think in, in English, you can say it in French and so on. So this, this C is the context vector is your abstraction. So this model is called uh, sequence to sequence. And uh, if you look at the, the dec I mean uh, decoder I mean, in encoder, you have observations of your French sentence. In, in your decoder, you are predicting, you know, given this context, you are predicting the first word in English, and you pass this first word as a second observation to, uh, to predict the second word and third word and so on. Okay? So pay attention to this connection, you know, the output of this uh, unit will be the input of the next one, okay, in, in sequence to sequence. <clears throat> so you can use this uh, for uh, translation, for example, for question answering when uh, the input is question, the output is the answer of that question, or the input is a sentence in one language and the output is in a different language. And this uh, context vector is the last hidden state, which will be passed. So the whole sentence has been distilled here. This is uh, a nice uh, representation of what's happening in sequence to sequence. Okay. Okay, this is nice, but there are some problems with this. And the main challenge and main problem is the problem of long-range dependencies. And what do we mean by long-range dependencies? Uh, you you uh, try to capture the whole information of a sequence in one single vector. It's a sentence. If the sentence is long, you can imagine that uh, you know, apparently, I mean, clearly in each hidden space, you know, which is influenced from the previous one. Uh, so, for example, in H10, H10 is most affected by H9, and H9 is most affected by H7. So, when you get to H10, H1 is almost forgotten, right? So, if you have a long sentence, uh, the dependency of your hidden state at the end is pretty negligible with the words at the beginning of the sequence. 
if you're doing question answering and you give me a text and then you ask a question and the answer of this question has to do with the beginning of this paragraph most likely I don't have this information in the, my, my context vector when I pass it to decoder so this is the main challenge okay <clears throat> And, and there's another challenge in terms of computation that's not easy to uh, basically run it in a, in a, in a parallel manner because by nature RNN generates one word after another word. Okay, but, but the main challenge is the first one, which affects you know, not just uh, computational efficiency but the performance of the output. Uh, this is where the concept of attention comes to play and play an important role actually. Uh, attention introduced in the context of natural language processing in RNN in 2014 and 15. Later on it was introduced in the context of um, uh, image processing. But I start with, just to, to give you an idea, I, I start with uh, this example from image processing. Um, you know, if I show you this picture, you pay attention to stop sign here, right? There are many other things in this picture. There are backgrounds, but you don't pay attention to this. And, and if I ask you what, what this picture is about, you, you will tell me it's a uh, stop sign, right? But there are many other things. Uh, as if when I'm looking at this picture, I'm looking only at this part, and the, the rest of the picture has been like faded. You know, I don't pay attention to those. Uh, similar to this one. I would say that attention is a fancy name for weighted average. You know, because the second image can be created using the first one by weighted average of pixels. You know, if I just compute the weighted average in a way that I give higher weights to this part and low weights to the rest of the picture, uh, it, it, it leads to this one, right? So that's basically what's happening in attention. Attention is weighted average. <coughs> and this has been introduced in 2014 and 15 in these two important papers. Uh, in, in the context of uh, language. So when we can make uh, a sequence to sequence model with attention, you know, what I introduced to, to you so far was uh, sequence to sequence without attention when you have a context vector, which is distillation of the whole sequence. Now assume that you have a sequence to sequence model, but uh, it's not just one single context vector which will be passed to the decoder. You will pass several vectors to the decoder. And these several vectors is a weighted sum of hidden space of the encoder. If I have three hidden space, you know, I will pass not only C, but C1, C2, C3. And C1 is a hidden, is a weighted combination of H1, H2, H3. And C2 is another weighted sum. And C3 is another weighted sum. And these weighted sums has to do with the word that I want to predict at the moment. The coder wants to predict a word. And through a mechanism, which I'm going to explain, I would decide which C should be. Uh, considered now, you know, and this C has to do with, 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 the, with the context, you know. Maybe the, the first part of the sentence is more important, so I should give higher weights to H1. Maybe the last part of the sentence is more important, I should give higher weights to the last part, right? So if we uh, <clears throat> just, let's see this illustration and we'll see this Better. So encoder is the same, 
but we can see that it's not only one context vector, it's several context vector which will be passed, okay? So, um, the context vectors would be linear combinations of, you know, you can think of attention as a function which takes some input and compute the weighted sum of the inputs, okay? So, uh, so this is basically a weighted This is a weighted sum of this three input. So this is one of my context vectors. And there is uh, another actually uh, weighted sum. Which makes another context vector. Okay. So think of attention as a function which uh, compute the weighted sum of its input. <clears throat> uh, this was introduced in 2014, sequence to sequence with attention. Conceptually, what you need to compute in uh, your sequence model is a conditional probability. You want to predict the word at position i. It's as if you're computing the probability of word yi given any word that you have seen so far. You know, <clears throat> I am a, and you want to predict what? You know, teacher, student, chair, table, door. You know, uh, for the whole vocabulary, you have distribution of you have distribution probability over all vocabulary. And uh, I have to compute this. I have to see the probability of teacher is more than door. You know, I, I, I'm a door doesn't make sense, you know, but I'm teacher makes sense or I'm a student makes sense. So I should give higher probability to this. So conceptually, I have to compute this conditional probability or my model should compute this conditional probability. And we compute this conditional probability through a function g, and this function g is our model, right? So this function g is basically a function which at, when it computes this probability by i, uh, and the way that it computes the probability by i is that at, at position yi, at position yi, it takes yi minus one as the input, and it takes, the, and, and it has to do with this state. Okay, so this is the output. The output is here. And this output has to do with this state and with the observation, the previous word that I've seen. Only the previous word, not the word before that, right? Only the previous word. <clears throat> so, but I need all of these previous words. Not only this one. So all of these previous words <clears throat> comes from this context vector. And uh, <clears throat> you can see that it comes from the context vector, a true uh, chain of computation, right? So this C will influence I minus one, and through that, I will be affected. So through a chain of computation, I have access to C, not direct access to C, you know, implicit access to C. In sequence to sequence with attention, as I said, it's not just one context vector, it's several context vector, and this several context vector is weighted sum of these hidden spaces. So if you want to compare these two, it's a function of yi minus one li, but ci, not just c. And CI is different. It has to do with the board I that you want, and the position I that you want to compute. <clears throat> okay. So how do I compute CI? You know, 
Um, <clears throat> I can compute the similarity, you know, I, I'm in this position, and I compute the similarity of this hidden space. You know, I want to compute the word yi. And word yi to compute, it's a function of yi minus 1 and li, right? So the state right before this, which was li, and li minus 1, I can look at the similarity between I minus 1 and all hidden space of the encoder, H1, H2, H3, okay? So uh, I'm, my, my decoder is supposed to answer a question, and there is a text. Which part of this text is important, you know? different parts of this text have been encoded in, in, in different hidden space of the encoder, H1, H2, H3. And if I look at this, uh, at this vector, the vector right before the word that I want to predict at the moment, and then compare the similarity between this and all of these hidden spaces. Okay? And using this similarity, make an average of these three hidden spaces. If you want to see it precisely, you compute the similarity, and then you interpret the similarity as sort of probability, or you know, a, a coefficient which sums to one, and you do it through softmax. You know, if you, this is your similarity, you compute this coefficient such that they are positive and they sum to one, and then you compute the weighted sum of all of these hidden spaces. That's going to be your CI. Hmm? Is that clear? Any question here? Uh, so you may ask that, okay, this hidden, I mean, we are adding some vectors, why this vector should be meaningful. Uh, at all, you know, by like mm, up, like uh, arithmetic operation on vectors which uh, capture some concepts. It's not that intuitive that it's going to be a meaningful operation. But, you know, um, uh, there was an algorithm which uh, we used to cover with maybe not anymore, word to vec. It was a state of the art for representing words. And uh, so we may not cover it or we may cover it at the end of the course if we have enough time because it's not a state of the art anymore and we don't use it often. We learn the representation of the word in, in, in a different way. Um, I mean, through back-to-back -back learning. But word to vec was an algorithm to learn represent vector representation for words. Something quite interesting that they, as, as a showcase they showed in their paper, and it, it got even news coverage, was that if you have a representation of the word king, king is a vector. And so put the uh, vector of king and you have a representation of man. Man is a vector. So subtract this. And you have a representation for woman. So add it to this. They showed that it's going to be pretty close to queen. So a king who is not a man, but is a woman, is, is queen. And even more interesting things, you know, the name of a hockey team in Toronto, minus Toronto, plus Montreal, becomes the name of hockey team in Montreal, for example. Um, so it, it, it might sound mysterious, but uh, if you manage to uh, represent a word in a space such that uh, similar concepts are close to each other, like concept of king and concept of queen is close to each other, 
and concept of man and concept of woman is close to each other. So we can see the fact that, uh, you know, these distances are meaningful then, you know. If, if you have a, a space such that similar concepts uh, semantically are close to each other in terms of vector, then these distances are meaningful. You know, you can subtract them. So the, the same thing happens here. You can uh, compute the weighted sum of some hidden space, and it's meaningful. You know, it's, it's, it's weighted sum of these concepts. <coughs> okay. Um, One, one question, uh, I, I told you that we don't have direct, let me show you this. I told you that we don't have direct access to C when we compute this function. And we have implicit access to C through chain of computation. So what about this one? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm computing the word yi. I've already computed word yi minus one. And when I wanted to predict y i minus one, my context vector was c one, for example. Now I want to compute y i, and my context vector is different because I take a weighted average, and it's different from the weighted average of the uh, context vector that I used for the previous one. So what's going to happen here? Should I come back and do this chain of computation by this new word, new context vector? The difference is that in, in, in um, sequence with attention, we do have direct access to context vectors. So usually we predict the first word with uh, the last state of the, the decoder the context C, and then for each of them we compute this weighted sum, but we do have direct access. The way that we have direct access has different forms, but a common one is to concatenate this with this hidden space. When you want to pass it to uh, your function, you concatenate this CI to your hidden space, and then, uh, to, yes. Um, does your, like if you're trying to compute YI, do you have access to all of the context vectors, like CI minus one, CI, and CI plus one, or is it just? You, you compute it at a time, you know. It's not that you compute everything and then you have access to all of them. You get to this point YI, and at point YI, you compute the similarity, you compute this coefficient, you compute this weighted sum, and it's your CR. So for each, for each YI, there exists a CI that you computed at that time. But, so then you're not using the other no, no. You just used that. Okay. So I've already explained this, uh, but it's you know an illustration of what what would be explained. You know the context is just weighted sum of previous uh, hidden space, hidden space of encoder which computed as similarity and uh, translated to coefficient. <clears throat> so this is a nice example from their paper, this 2014 paper. And uh, in a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model that translates from French to English, uh, if you compute this uh, alignment, you know, when you do this coefficient and compute this alignment to see uh, the new word in English that you want to predict. For example, when you want to predict this word, August, uh, which word has been attended to, or which part of the English, of the French sentence was uh, attended to. You can see a nice align, uh, alignment. Um, you know, it's this matrix is mainly uh, orthogonal. So this has been aligned to this. This has been aligned to this. So it's one-to-one -one alignment between French and English words. But there is an exception here. And the exception is that uh, European has been aligned to this word. 
and economy to this word and area to this one. So it's basically um, in English, if you say uh, European economic area, if you want to say it in France, you have to reverse the order of words, right? So the, the attention here is not uh, on, on, on a diagonal of the matrix, you know, the order has been reversed. So it, it means that it, it basically does what we wanted this to do, right? To uh, find the, the part of the sentence or part of the sequence that it needs to attend to. Okay, now you want to get to the concept of self-attention. <coughs> And self-attention is the core idea of transformers that we are going to learn later. Uh, there are a couple of terms in self-attention. The uh, term key, query, and uh, value. These three terms comes from the literature of database and database search. So let me start before we talk about self-attention. Let's start with this uh, simple example of database. Um, you know, this is how we represent a database uh, with these two terms, key and value. <clears throat> and this is, suppose that this uh, table of contact numbers, these are telephone numbers of different people. You have a query, and the query is to find the phone number of Bob, and then you search in your keys, and Bob Smith match one of your keys and then you report the value corresponding to this key okay this is for exact match when bob smith exists in your table and you have just a lookup table find the, the exact match in some cases there is no exact match there is some sort of approximate match or soft match uh, i have this table which the first column tells me the box size and the second column tells me the weight, okay? So uh, if the box size is 300 cubic inch, then the, the weight of this is 30 pound. But I get a query which does not exist here and the query is 360. Okay, so I don't have it here. Uh, it doesn't match any of these. But it has similarity to 300 and to 400. And through this similarity, I might be able to make some sort of weighted average of the weights and come up with the approximate weight of a box of this size. So we can do some simple calculation, compute a similarity between 360, which is your query, and different keys. So have these terms and what we are doing here in mind, because that's exactly what we are going to do in self-attention. So compute the similarity of your query with different keys. So with, with 300 is one of my keys, 400 is another key, and 360 is my um, uh, query. So I basically went over the absolute value of the difference. This is my similarity. I can, you can come up with a different similarity measure, you know, the one that you like. It's just one random similarity measure. And then if I pass it through a softmax, I can compute two, I can compute this A1 and A2 as two coefficients such that they're positive and sum to one. And then I can compute the weighted average of, you know, that was 300 was corresponding to 30, 400 was corresponding to 40. Then I can compute the weighted average of these two based on A1 and A2 and come up with 36. So 36 was not in my table, but I approximated that the weight corresponding to this query would be 36. So I do a weighted average of values. So query comes, query does not exist in the table. I measure the similarity of query with keys, compute some coefficients based on that, 
compute the weighted average of values corresponding to those keys. Okay. This is exactly what we are doing in self-attention. But why we are doing this in self-attention? <coughs> uh, you know, uh, we can have word embedding. I gave you an example, like word to vec, for example, or different methods for representation of words. But that may not be sufficient because there are composition of words that convey meaning that does not exist in the single word individually. Uh, the self-attention was introduced in 2016 in this paper. And uh, <clears throat> the, the main intuition was that knowing the individual words in a sentence is not sufficient to understand the sentence. Sometimes you may need to understand the meaning of composition of different words, right? So word embedding is not sufficient. You have to have a way that you have embeddings of word and you have embedding of composition of words at the same time in different levels, not in one level, you know. In one level it's just words, in another level it's some of the words together in another words level is some of these composition words together and so on. <clears throat> this is an example. Suppose that I have this sentence, the early beard catches the worm, right? And you can see that early beard uh, is different from early and different from Baird, you know, it's uh, basically c conceptually has something to do about promptness. And catches the worm also. It's different from catch, different from word, different from D. All together implies reward, reward of being prompt. <coughs> so, uh, you need a way to combine early and beard. You need a way to combine catches and worm together. And that's the main intuition behind uh, <coughs> self-attention. This is lesson of today, actually. Who said this, you know? Have you heard this before? Shell Silverstein. <coughs> yeah. Anyway. <laughs> okay, so this is another example. Another example that you may need to, uh, I mean, how self attention comes to play. If you have this word, the FBI is chasing a criminal on the run. Red is the word that you are reading at the moment. And this shade basically is your memory from the past. Uh, you know, when I'm saying, for example, when I'm here, chasing. Who is chasing? FBI is chasing. So somehow I should attend more to FBI rather than D or is, you know, when I'm reading the word chasing, for example. And uh, so chasing was here. When I'm reading chasing, I have to attend to FBI and is, for example, more than anything else. And for, for other examples here, you know. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so uh, the definition of self-attention is as follows, with the uh, terminology of uh, terminology of uh, database search. 
you have query, you have key, and you have values. And uh, the idea is that given a query, you find a new value. And this new value could be a weighted sum of these values based on the similarity of query and key. And so attention is a function of these three values, query, Q, K, and V. And K is all of the keys that you have. V is all of the values that you have. But query is just one individual query that you have. And you need to compute the similarity between this individual query that you have with all keys. And based on the similarity, find the weighted average of values. This is the general definition of attention. And it's general because it covers both exact match and approximate match, right? If I do have Bob Smith in this table, when I compute the similarity, the similarity of Bob Smith and one of the keys, which is Bob Smith, would be one. And the similarity with others would be zero. And then this just turns back the values corresponding to Bobby Smith, which is the telephone number of Bobby Smith. Otherwise, if you are in the example of weights and size of the boxes, you know, it's going to take the weighted average of them. <coughs> okay. Uh, <coughs> That's exactly, that's what I explain now. Okay, let's come back. Any, any question? Okay, let's come back to uh, examples that we have, this sentence. The early bird catches the worm. Uh, it is self-attention. Each word, you know, this might be a little bit confusing. Each word plays three different roles. A word is query, a word is key, and a word is value. So all of the words in the sentence play all of these three uh, roles. <clears throat> so basically you can assume if you want to make an analogy with the database, you can assume that you have a table and in this table, all of the words in this sentence are queries, all of the words in this sentence are keys, and all of the words in the sentence are values. And we have a vector representation for each single word, right? So we tokenize our sentence as words or tokens, and then we have a vector representation for each of them. And suppose that I call this vector representation E. E, D means the vector representation for the word D. Okay, now suppose that I'm going to uh, do find similarity. If I look at the word beard, for example, and want to compute the similarity of word beard with, you know, this is my query now. And this query, I have to compute the similarity of this with all of the keys. So what's the similarity of Baird with D? What's the similarity of Baird with Early? There is no similarity. You know, there's no similarity between D and Baird. <coughs> there is no similarity between Baird and Early. There is similarity between Baird and Baird, but not any other word. I mean, I don't see any reason to believe that uh, early should be more connected to Baird than Vor, you know? But what was our intuition of doing self-attention? We wanted a way to make a composition, you know? I wanted somehow to decide that early Baird is a new concept. So I have to detect some sort of similarity between early and Baird, but my vector representation by itself doesn't show any similarity by itself. So inherently, 
these vectors doesn't show any similarity. This is something that I have to learn. How should I learn this? You know, I have a huge amount of data and possibly in many cases I have this two words together, early beard, which convey the concept of being prompt. And through the process of the whole corpus, I have to learn that there are similarity between these two. I have to capture that. But I've already decided about the vector representation. Either I have to change this vector representation in a way that, you know, the similarity uh, present itself in the vector representation, or I have to come with a new representation, okay? And um, if I change the vector itself, the problem is that, you know, in this context, early and Baird are similar, but in a different context, maybe early and Baird are not similar. So I shouldn't decide that early and Baird always have the same similar representation. You know, it depends on the context. So to make it more general, I am going to decide to have three different representations for each word. Not single representation, you know, now each word has a single representation. I'm going to have three representations for each word. Word beard as query has one representation. Word beard as key has a different representation. And word beard as value has a different representation. And I can do this simply by introducing three transformation matrix. <clears throat> you know, I have uh, my sentence. I represent each of them as a vector. And this vector for each uh, board, say, is d dimensional. Okay? Then this is the representation of my word. X, D, Baird, whatever, okay? Uh, what I'm going to do, actually, is to define three matrices, W, Q, to turn this E to a query vector, okay? And suppose that the query vectors are in p-dimensional space. So this is, uh, this should be, you know, this is uh, d by 1. This should be p by d. So w q is d by p. So w q transpose is p by d, right? And this is going to make a query vector corresponding to this. And then I have another matrix, WK, which will be multiplied to the same vector, but it makes a vector which represents the same word as a key. And Another matrix, all of them are D by P. Another matrix, which will be multiplied to the same vector, represented as value. Okay? Is that clear? Um, what does D by P represent? It's just dimension. Okay. Dimension of the matrix. So suppose that your word embedding is in d-dimensional space to be completely general and your representation of queries and keys are in p-dimensional. You may decide that p and d are the same, you know. You may decide that all of them are in the same dimensional space. But to be completely general, let's assume that they are different, you know. We want to choose p to be, say, for a smaller than d. It's just dimensionality of the space. Okay. Yes. How do you learn this matrix? Good. 
through back propagation. We'll see that. We don't know these matrices, you know. And uh, this is how actually eventually we learn that Baird and Early has something to do with each other, you know, because we don't know these matrices. We compute the similarity between W, you know, Baird comes as query, right? And you want to compute the similarity of Baird of with all words, but you don't compute the similarity of vector representing Baird with all words. You first turn it to, you first multiply this by WQ. Now this is your query. Then you compute the similarity of this with all other words, including the bird itself. But when you want to compare it, you compare it in, in this form, you know, it's a uh, key. Key of D, key of Baird, key of Early, right? So I compute the similarity. So inherently, my model doesn't know that Baird and Early has anything to do with each other. But through time, I'm going to learn these W's in a way that Baird and Early becomes similar or shows some similarity in this context. So we don't know them. We, le we learn. <clears throat> that these are parameters of the model. Yes? Usually it's small. Yeah. Is there a reason for that? Uh, reason, actually, you know, there are some optimum values for D, which is, doesn't have any mathematical justification. It's just based on experiment that, you know, uh, if you choose B to be this dimension, you know, 10, 24, for example, you're going to have a, a nice representation. And then uh, depends on the dimensionality of P, you know, you see that you're introducing so many new parameters, you know, in all of these W's are parameters. And the larger the P is, the number of parameters are more, you know, because these matrices are larger. So again, through experiment, you would see that with, with P would be sufficient. The, the, the smallest, the P and D, are going to be the less number of parameters to learn you have, right? But uh, usually through trial and, and trial and error, we go for some optimum numbers that shows good performance without any ju mathematical justification, just trial and error. And in these trials, you know, P is smaller than D. I mean, it would be sufficient. You don't need a very large. There was another question here. Yes. So we're, like, right now we're looking at the similarity between one word and all the other words. Where does the value come in? Like Where the values come in, you know, uh, I wanted to show this in a slide, but let me uh, do it here. You know, the word Baird comes, you compute the similarity of word Baird with all other words, right? And you have a similarity of word Baird with all of word J's, right? And then you pass it through softmax. Basically, you compute e to the power of sij divided by summation of all of j's for all j's. And this is your alpha. This is your coefficient, right? And then you multiply this coefficient to all of the values. So it's going to be alpha 1 times the value of word D. And the value of word D is W, V transpose for word D. Plus some alpha 2, which is, comes from the similarity. For the value of word Baird plus alpha 3 
for word early. So that's going to be your new value, the new value for Baird. Right, the new value for Baird is the weighted sum of all of the values that you had before. Uh, <coughs> is that clear? I'm not sure actually. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? So, because, so, so like that does not, I don't think. Okay, let, let me show, maybe with the slides it becomes more clear because I have it in, in the slide as well. But if it's not, let me know. Um, so, um, uh, you know, we have the word Baird, and you calculate the attention with all of these other words. And to calculate the attention, basically, you compute the similarity, right? And the similarity, the common type of similarity is just dot product of these two vectors. Could be different things as well, but usually it's normalized dot product. And then apply soft max you know, to make it like coefficient. So you compute softmax of Baird with all words, right? And then you have some coefficients, the coefficient times the value of D, the coefficient of value of early, and all of these values, that would be the new value of Baird. I think what I'm confused about that is, what's WB? Uh, What's W V? Like if you if you have this and then you have this also. Mm -hmm. So which which one is? Like? I have what? Sorry. You, you're taking the sum of the yeah, all the coefficients times these like with W V mm -hmm. of each single word, and then right, like how 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 do we see each other? You know, oh, uh, oh, okay. you you have a query, right? Query should be compared with all keys. And suppose that we do it through dot product and then we compute softmax, right? And it gives us some coefficient. Depends on this, the coefficient would be and coefficients, right? And my new value for this query would be summation of this AIs VIs I equal 1 to N. That's my new value for the square, right? But what I said is that query, key, and value for a single word have three different representations. You want to represent Q for this word, multiply this word by WQ. You want to have the key representation of this word, multiply this word by WK and this by WV. That's why I put WV here. This WV times E is my VI. Okay, One, okay. yes. And then second thing because it's soft max, you know. And the second thing is from this comp like over here. Mm -hmm. Your V is not like you did not just take X and then split it into three vectors, you computed the V using yeah. K and Q. Yeah, these are these are things that you will learn through back propagation. We'll do it late. But like like Q and K you could just take out of the word embedding, right? Kind of. Like mm. you multiply them by this? Now this is WQ transpose times X. And then same thing with K, but then V is produced out of Q and K, not just on its own. Like you have to do this. Right you have to learn all of them at the 
same time. You know, it's not that these two are fixed and then you compute this. You compute all of these three matrix and representation of this at the same time through back propagation. You don't have pre-calculation for word embedding. You don't have pre-calculation for any of these matrices. So these are parameters of your model. You initialize it at the beginning and through back propagation, you learn all of them. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so this is an illustration of the, the process. You know, you have a query and you have some keys. You compute similarities between query and all of the keys. And this similarity could be different things. The, the common one is dot product and normalized dot product. This is the most common one. Okay, normalized dot product. It could be many different things. Doesn't matter. And then you compute the softmax of the similarity. So it gives you the coefficient. And this coefficient basically, uh, you know, you make weighted sum of Ws and gives you new values, okay? Okay, so it, it's going to be more clear and understandable if I represent everything in matrix form. So it, it gives us more insight to what's, what's happening here if, if we do it in matrix form. So suppose that my words are in d-dimensional space. Okay, that's basically my vector representation of words are in d-dimensional space. Uh, in some slide, I use E same thing, you know. Uh, I'm going to change those sliders. Didn't pay attention that there's a discrepancy between this notation. So these are my words, right, in D dimension. <clears throat> so uh, I can define a matrix X such that it contains all of the words that I have. And if I have N words, it's going to be D by N matrix, right? I'm going to define matrix Q. These are representations of these words when they play the role of a query. So it's Q1 to Qn, and it's P by N. And I have matrix of Q, representation of these words when they play a uh, role of keys. Again, P by N. And matrix V, all of these when play the role of values. Right? So then I have matrix W. Q, which is uh, a matrix which is D by P, right? So X is D by N, W transpose, it should be P by D, so it's D by P, yes. So it's D by P, W K, which is D by P, and W, V, which is D by P. Then attention is Q transpose times uh, K. You know, the dot product between query and keys. And usually you normalize it as well. Then, one, one over P 
PQ transpose K. Then you take soft max to make them the coefficients times V. Okay. So this is going to be your new V's. This is your old V. This is going to be your new V. Let me call it Z. So this is, uh, what's the dimensionality of this Q? Or what's the dimensionality of K? K is P by N, right? And uh, Q is Q transpose N by P. So this is N by N. And V is uh, P by N, right? So it, so this is P by N and this will be P by N. So new representation, that's your new V. So this is basically self-attention okay, in matrix form. <clears throat> Any question? OK, yes. You do it for everything. Yes, right. And you do it many times. Yeah. So we will learn about transformer later in next lecture. And transformers are layers of attention. You know, you do this and then you do it. You do it. So you learn a new representation and then you do attention on this new representation. Then you do attention on this new representation many times. Yeah, there's no dictionary. We have to learn. So uh, Look at this quantity, Q transpose dub, uh, K. So Q is what? Q is basically, you know, let me write them here. So Q is WQ transpose X. And K is WK transpose X. And V is WK transpose X. So Q transpose is X transpose uh, W Q. And K is W K transpose X. W Q and W K are not the same, but if they are the same, what this is going to be. It's going to be a kernel, a kernel or X. And kernel shows similarity between words, right? Um, but these two are not the same. In, in fact, in some implementation, they make them the same, you know, to save computation. If they're the same, it is a kernel. If they are not the same, it's not a kernel because kernel should be symmetric. So it's sort of asymmetric kernel, but asymmetric kernel doesn't make sense mathematically, you know, kernels should be symmetric. But you can think of this as some sort of computing the similarity in a way that it's not symmetric. So the similarity of Baird and Early is not the same as similarity of Early and Baird. So order is important, right? <coughs> but it's, it's sort of a uh, kernel. So basically you can think of this as some coefficient for V. You know, these, these V's, like this is my V1 to Vn. And you can think of this as similarities, kernels. And each new column of Z is just multiplication of one row of this with this columns, right? So as if these are coefficient of this V. So I compute the similarities and then use those similarities as coefficient of my values, compute the new value. Okay. So 
So this is in matrix form. Um, okay, uh, so that was attention in uh, language, basically. But attention can be used in uh, basically computer region as well and uh, was introduced after introducing attention in language. That was 2014 and 15. It was introduced in 2016. Um, so in sequence to sequence model, we had two RNNs. And then we had like a, a context vector at the middle of these two, between these two. Now suppose that I have a CNN and RNN, and this context vector comes here. So I don't want to translate French to English. I want to translate an image to a text. I have this image. I want to write a caption for this image, for example. You know, so what this image is. Again, you know, I have an encoder. I have encoder and my encoder is not RNN because I'm not dealing with the sequential data, I'm dealing with an image. And then it, it makes a context vector and this context vector will be passed to my sequential model which is RNN, it's LSTM or whatever. Uh, <clears throat> and you can write captions for different images for example. So you can do this without attention, which possibly is not going to work, you know, it's not going to make meaningful captions. And you can do it with attention. And when you want to do it with attention, it's pretty similar to sequence to sequence model with attention. In sequence to sequence model with attention, we computed the Li minus one, which was the hidden state of uh, hidden states right before the word that we want to predict and we compare the similarity of this with H1, H2, H3 and Hn the hidden uh, states of encoder right so do something similar here you know you have uh, you have a CNN And this CNN has many layers. And these layers are um, feature maps or representations of your input image in different ways. And look at the, some of these feature maps, early stage of this feature maps. This is one representation of your input image. And take different patches of this image and vectorize them. Okay, I take different patches of them and vectorize them. <clears throat> and, and each of these vectors have information, some uh, basically uh, information of different locations of this picture, right? Okay, so these are vectorized form of different patches. And then I want to generate a sentence. I can compute the hidden state, exactly the same thing. You know, when you want to predict the word T, compute the hidden space of right before that word that you want to predict. You know, with all of the, you know, with all of the, we, we used to compare it with all of the hidden state of the encoder. So computed with all of these vectors as if they are hidden states of your encoder. These are not hidden state, these are informed patches of the image. You want to see that the word that you want to predict now has more similarity to this part of the picture or this part of the picture, you know? It says something about this part of the picture or it says something about that part of the picture. And the rest is exactly the same, compute, I mean, pass it through softmax and then compute uh, 
I mean, we used to do uh, weighted sum, but instead of weighted sum, apply a function to it. You know, weighted sum is just a you know particular form of a, a function. You know, but this function in this case might be more complicated than just a weighted sum. So this function is a neural network. Similarity also used to we used to do like uh, dot product, but a more general form. A, 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 you know, a neural network which compute the similarity. So the weights of this neural network should be learned, the weight of this neural network should be weight, but the, everything else is exactly the same. Just accept that uh, instead of comparing this with the hidden state of encoder, compare this with uh, Vs of different layers of the encoder. <clears throat> and that's it, then you can give it an image, you can, uh, I mean, in this paper they show that they can come up with a nice caption explaining that image. <clears throat> Any question? Yes? So you were saying that um, one, one of the things we're doing we're trying to find some compositionality in language, right? And like from a loose term of um, from a loose definition, this is like what we're doing in CNS as well. Right? You can't find compositionality in a picture of like what is what makes like a hierarchy of shapes. No, no, sorry, uh, that's important. This composition was for self-attention. We are not doing self-attention, you know. Make analogy of this with sequence-to-sequence -sequence model. And sequence-to-sequence, -sequence, we didn't do self-attention. We, we did cross-attention. Similarity of this with other words in French. Similarity of this word with other part of the picture. Not composition. But I'm asking, like, separate from this. Mm-hmm. Has anyone done like the CNN version of for text? So like where you're trying to learn loosely. Yeah, the image transformer. It's called image transform. But that's that's for vision. I'm saying like for language, like just like on its own, learning the compositionality in language. Okay. Some words come together using and see it like some version of convolutions. Not like it's not the same convolution obviously as like. So how can we do that? Well, that's, yeah, that's what I'm asking. Like, mm -hmm. is, is there some kind of convolution operation that you can apply? To you can apply convolution to text. It's pretty common. It used to be more common before transformers. But to compute the composition, I'm not sure what exactly. Mm -hmm. 